Well, Candice, always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks a lot for joining in here on CNBC TV, and congratulations on the conference as well. Thank well, you. Well, uh, you know, since it's an election year, both here in India as well as the United States, the stock market seems to be a little bit skittish. But data points prove or history proves that actually equity markets do quite well in election years. Tell us more about that statistic. Yeah, that's ab absolutely true. On average, if you go back in the U.S. over um, multiple, multiple elections, yeah. the uh, market is typically up 11 percent on average during an election. Uh, there can be a lot of volatility, uh, but typically the market is up. Okay, all right. So U.S. markets, in fact, they do well in an election year, which is quite interesting. Tell us, do you have a level on the U.S. markets? Because the mother market has been doing well, and that obviously helps an emerging market like India when you have some stability out there. But do you have a level on the S&P 500? Yeah, on the S&P 500, we're looking for 5,400. Mm -hmm. So, a you know, sort of very modest upside uh, from here. I do expect that there will be some volatility. Okay. Uh, in fact, if you look at it on average uh, in each year, there's about a 5% down movement. Um, so I expect there will be volatility, particularly in an election year. Right. But we're looking for 5,400, and that's really driven by earnings because it's earnings and profits that drive stocks at least in the United States yes. not elections indeed uh, you know since we're talking about the United States what stands out is the kind of move you've seen the magnificent seven yeah. and Nvidia has been in a world of its own <laughs> you know in the last if you, if you plot a one month chart a one year chart or an 18 month chart that stock has been on fire yeah. So tell us about, uh, you know, how do you see the Magnificent Seven pan out as well as a quick comment on NVIDIA. So basically, if you look at the Magnificent Seven, they are seven disparate companies. And in fact, we at Bank of America, you know, coined the term, the yes. Magnificent Seven. Uh, so what you're seeing is that if you go back to last year, you mm -hmm. saw the earnings growth of the Magnificent Seven was dramatically higher you're right. than the rest of the market. But what you're going to see going forward, and you've already started to see, is that those two um, earnings growth ratios are coming together. Mm -hmm. And by the fourth quarter of this year, we think the Magnificent Seven earnings growth will be about 15 percent, and the 493 will be 14 okay. percent. Oh, okay. And so we really think there's going to be this broadening out uh, of the uh, of the the market to the 493. Right. We still have a buy on NVIDIA. We recently raised our uh, price target on it. Uh, you know, we see great things ahead for NVIDIA. Okay, so the U.S. market seems to be in a good space as of now. But let's come back home to India, you know, <laughs> and let's talk about the emerging markets. You know, there's been that toss-up between India and China. And I think uh, you all had a tactical call that China will do well in the last few months, from January onwards, if I'm not mistaken. What's the call right now? Because India's got some political stability, earnings, as you said. That's the fundamental driver of for markets ultimately. Stability, policy continuity, and uh, we seem to be in a sweet spot. How do you all toss up the two now between India as well as China? Well, basically, as you said, you know, we think tactically that there's some reasons to be constructive mm -hmm. on China. Uh, if you look at it, as a matter of fact, in January, pessimism about China reached the highest level ever. Okay. And then after that, we started to see some reforms. We've started to see, you know, some better economic data come through. So we're constructive on China in the short term, but in the longer term, we very much prefer India because of the demographics, because of the, the that they're just beginning the growth cycle that China started, you know, decades ago. Yes. There's a whole host of reasons why we're more positive on India longer term than China. And on emerging markets overall, I would say that if we have a soft landing yes. in the U.S., mm -hmm. that means we're going to have a takeoff right. for emerging markets. Okay. Uh, you know, since we're talking about China, what's happened with China, you know, the policy measures we've been getting from the government out there as well as the central bank, is that commodity prices have moved up. You know, at some point of time, that could be a bit of a risk for this, uh, you know, this inflation cooling off. How are you all placed on commodities, if you could comment on that? And given uh, inflation could again, you know, peak, perk up a little bit, what are you all factoring in, in terms of Fed action for this year itself? So basically, as it relates to commodities, on the energy side, we think the demand has been a little bit weak and the energy prices have been, you know, largely driven by geopolitical concerns. And remember, the United States is energy independent, right? And mm. so energy, we're not really concerned about but copper and other base metals we do see a very large uh, demand 
for those base metals, particularly as we go through the green revolution, AI, et cetera. We need all of those metals to, um, to fuel that revolution. And as it relates to the Fed, yeah. uh, what we're looking for there is we're looking for the first cut to happen in December. Okay. Uh, and then we're looking for four more cuts next year, and we think we'll probably end with the terminal rate in 2026 of about 3.75%. Now, the risk yeah. is because, you know, we've all been waiting for these Fed cuts all year. Yeah. But obviously, you know, the risk is that inflation comes in even hotter and the Fed doesn't uh, cut at all. Oh, all right. Uh, and you all are penciling in a first cut in December itself. Yes. Right? You know, we started this year thinking that maybe March you get an outside chance that you get a cut. Then we said maybe in the middle of the year, September. But you're saying maybe December. And the risk is maybe we don't see one. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the reasons is because the U.S. consumer has been so much stronger than Indeed. anyone predicted. Uh, you know, the U.S., the great preponderance of mortgages in the United States are fixed rate. Right. So if you have a fixed rate mortgage and you don't have very much credit card debt, yeah. inflation really doesn't impact you True. very much. Yeah. So we've seen the U.S. consumer, you know, not be impacted by rising rates. Plus, we've seen good growth in wages and a very solid job. Market. So the U.S. consumer has held up very, very well. Indeed. Uh, and just to get done with the word on commodities, and then I think uh, my co-anchors would uh, want to ask you a couple of questions. Copper is something you are still bullish on. And what about gold? We're bullish on both copper and on gold. Copper really is a function of you know the change to EVs, mm -hmm. and gold really is a function of the central banks wanting to diversify away from the U.S. dollar. Okay. All right. Uh, well, I think uh, Surbhi and Rima want to come in as well. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thanks for that, Nigel. I just have one quick question for Candence. Uh, great listening to you, Candence, uh, and appreciate you being with us. So at 5,400 on the S&P 500, uh, you're not expecting much of an upside, uh, you know, in, in the U.S. market. And the other point you made is extremely important as well. Convergence of uh, the earnings of the Magnificent Seven with the rest of the market. So are you predicting a scenario where perhaps returns start flattening out uh, for the U.S. market? And if that were to be the case, can we expect more foreign flows here in India? Because foreign flows have actually been absent. This is a domestic-led rally here so far this year. Well, yes, and that's kind of what I was trying to say before when I basically said that if you get a soft landing in the United States and earnings growth and GDP growth in the United States moderates, that means that there will be a pickup in growth in emerging markets. So yes, I think that would be very positive, for example, for India, which is our favorite pick among the EMs. Uh, Candice, morning. Uh, so the FBI holding in India is the lowest that we've seen in the last, uh, in over a decade now, despite India being a favorite over the longer term. Do you see that reversing anytime soon? Uh, that's, that's hard for me to predict, to be quite Frank, it depends on a lot of different factors. Certainly it should, uh, but it depends on a lot of different factors. So it's a hard one to call. Kadis, uh, if at all you've looked at this market in, in any more detail, uh, since this is your top emerging market pick, what do you like here? I mean, some of the manufacturing themes, uh, you know, capital expenditure, those stocks have run a lot in the country, but do you still like them? So, when we look at stocks, we look at stocks over, you know, a one to five year period. And we love the long term setup uh, in India with the demographics that you have here, with uh, the pro growth uh, government. We like all of the long term setup in India very, very much. Plus, remember, while India is very expensive, emerging markets overall are not particularly expensive. If you look at the U.S. market, it's trading at 21 times. The rest of the world is trading at 14 times. Well, yes, India is relatively expensive, but it's also the largest economy that's growing this rapidly and likely to do so for the next five to ten years. All right, uh, Candice, it's been a pleasure hearing your thoughts. We've taken uh, note of all the points you made. U.S. markets normally do well in election year. India, well, it's a structurally good story. Earnings ultimately will drive performance. And in terms of commodities, gold as well as copper, those two you're bullish on. Wishing you a good conference. And thanks a lot for speaking to us here at CNBC TV 18. Thank you, Nigel. Well, uh, back to you all in the studio.